tonight on Channel 6 News. The increase of violence towards Asian Americans continue to rise during this coronavirus pandemic and why scientists believe you should reconsider your next. Of course, the dogs is a big plus. Everybody loves that we get to work with dogs every day. I mean, that's that's the big next hate crime coming up next. Good evening, I'm Ryan Ankerman and this is Channel 6 News. While COVID-19 infections continue to ramp up here in the United States, so have the reported hate crimes against Asian Americans. But is this phenomenon something that is helpful to the pandemic or is it something that we've all misunderstood? They're being beaten, their properties defaced. Why there's a huge spike in Asian American hate crimes here in the U.S. during this pandemic, I spoke with Dr. Sai and Tease of the American Central Health Ops Organization to find out exactly why. So why do you think there's been such a large increase in violence towards Asian Americans? Well, the coronavirus was reported to have started in Wuhan, China, which according to our research is in fact an Asian country. Right. Therefore, here in the U.S., we believe that if people started to contract the virus locally, it would be at the fault of the Asians here. The Asian American people. However, after extensive research, we've made some new incredible discoveries. And one of them is that there's actually a geographical difference between the Asian Americans living here in the US and the Asian people living in Wuhan, China. Really? How big of a difference are we talking? About 11,640 kilometers or a little over 7,200 miles. Wow, that is a great distance and you are sure of this. My team and I have ran tests after tests on Asian Americans and each time they come back positive for being Americans living here in the US and not in China. I mean, some of them have never even been to China. It's amazing. How is that even possible? That is incredible. You will not believe the things we're finding. I mean, we're starting to see patterns that not all Asian Americans are even Chinese. No. And with that new information, we wanted to see how people would react to this groundbreaking discovery. So we went to the streets where I met Ray, one of many. Hi, everybody. Am I on? I think I am. <laughs> that was YouTuber Ryan Higa. Um, I hope you enjoyed that video. I'm Malik Pancholi. I am the co-founder of Act to Change. Uh, happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Thank you all for joining us for this third in our series of COVID combos. If you're interested in checking out the first two COVID combos, they're available to view at acttochange.org slash uh, backslash COVID-19. And they're also on our Facebook page, which is Act to Change. Um, just a little housekeeping as we start this, um, this chat off. If you have general thoughts, please use the chat feature on here. Also take a minute to hop on there, introduce yourself, let us know where you're from, say hello. Say hello to Jeremy Lin. Um, if you have questions for later on in this conversation, please use the Q&A feature. We're gonna be moderating those and we will save time for Q&A uh, later. I apologize in advance if we don't get to all of your questions, we will do our best. Um, before we hop in, just let me give you a little bit of background on Act to Change. Our mission here at Act to Change is simple. It's to end bullying against Asian American and Pacific Islander youth and to foster a world where all young people can celebrate their differences. We were first formed in 2015 as a White House campaign under President Obama. Today, we are a national nonprofit that serves AAPI youth. We have a number of anti-bullying resources at our website at acttochange.org. We also rely on your support. So if you're able to make a donation of any size, we greatly appreciate it. For the month of May, we are doing a month long giving campaign through GoFundMe. Um, there should be a link going up in the chat box soon. Um, if you're able to make a donation, it is fully tax deductible. So thank you. Um, we all know that the outbreak of COVID-19, the coronavirus has brought with it devastating consequences. And one of those is the alarming number of hate crimes and bullying incidents directed at the Asian American community. Um, you can see just some of the reports here on the slide. Uh, the FBI has released a report warning of a surge in hate crimes against Asian Americans. They included a story of a six-year-old and a two-year-old being stabbed. We have seen reports of people being sent to the emergency room for physical violence, being sprayed with Febreze or being chased down the street with disinfectants. 
not being allowed into stores, not being picked up by Ubers or Lyfts, being intimidated, having slurs yelled at them, and being cyberbullied. The online reporting forum Stop AAPI Hate has received more than 1,500 direct reports of discrimination against Asian Americans since it launched on March 17th. And we have so many more troubling stories listed um, on our website at acttochange.org that I hope you'll take a second to take a look at. Um, the Asian American community and our allies have been responding to this hate in some incredibly positive ways. And we're gonna flip to a slide that has some of that as well. You guys all saw the video at the beginning of this broadcast. Uh, Ryan Higa, YouTube star, made it for his 21.4 million subscribers. Uh, the first ever tracker of hate crimes against AAPIs was launched. And professional basketball player Jeremy Lin has pledged a million dollars to COVID relief. And we are so lucky to have him here with us today. He is zooming in from Beijing, where he is in training with the Beijing Ducks. And we hope that our conversation here today will open up discussions for all of you on ways to rise above the bullying and the hate. Now, Jeremy no, needs no introduction, but I'm gonna give you one anyway. Uh, he's an American professional basketball player currently playing for the Beijing Ducks. During the 2011-2012 season, while he was playing for the New York Knicks, Lin led a winning turnaround that generated the cultural phenomenon we all know as Lin Sanity. He is the first Asian American to win an NBA championship, and he has been vocal about the bullying and racism that he has faced. Quote, I grew up and played basketball in America, and all anyone wanted to tell me is that I wasn't American. Now I'm playing basketball in China, and I'm considered a foreigner. His foundation, the Jeremy Lin Foundation, serves youth by providing hope, empowerment, and leadership development. And Jeremy has used the hashtag Be the Light to encourage all of us to come together and shine our light. He has donated $500,000 between two organizations, Feeding America and Direct Relief, and is matching an additional $500,000. To date, that number is at over $800,000 going to COVID relief. We are also so lucky because Jeremy has been a supporter of Act to Change since we first launched in 2015. I cannot think of a better way to kick off Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Please welcome Jeremy Lin. Jeremy, hi. I think you might be muted. Ah, uh, I knew I did there something wrong. <laughs> no, for, first of all, what's up? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? You guys, by the way, I just want to, everyone to know that Jeremy is zooming in from Beijing. So forgive us if there's any technical issues. Um, but also, it is eight in the morning on a Saturday there. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for, for doing this. How, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I have practice in, in, uh, in a couple hours. So this is, this is cool. This is just getting up, making sure I get myself going a little bit. And, uh, other than that, I'm excited to talk, uh, you know, talk with you and talk about APHM and, and act of change and all that. And, uh, I think for me, it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be able to do this. At least it makes me feel a little bit connected to everything that's going on because I'm, you know, across the world. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. There's been so much excitement about you, um, you tuning in. I think most of the people who have logged on today already know who you are, but you've obviously been a role model to so many young people and particularly to so many Asian American and Pacific Islander young people. You dared to do something different. You're a pro basketball player. Um, can you just, Give us like a brief overview of your own journey and tell us about the obstacles that you faced pursuing your own dream and the things that you did to overcome them. Yeah, I, I grew up in um, Palo Alto, California, and uh, and you know I, I grew up there and I never really thought I loved basketball, but I didn't think much of it. My parents definitely didn't. You know, they were always in Chinese they would say "puling kao lan zhou It's like you can't you can't depend on basketball to to eat down the road and um 
And so they always like push the student athlete thing, but they ended up seeing how much I love basketball. So they were like, you know what, we're going to support you as much as you can. And, and so uh, one thing led to the next, I ended up at Harvard um, and played there. And then I ended up being able to make it going undrafted, but being able to make it to the NBA. And I, and I played uh, 10 years in the NBA. Um, and then, and then uh, my 11th season right now, um, I'm playing in, in the CBA in China for the Beijing Ducks. And so that's kind of just a short snapshot of, or, or a, a quick uh, description of kind of my, my basketball journey, but it's been a lot of fun. Um, I still get to hoop uh, every single day. That's amazing. Did you, do you feel like as an Asian American pursuing an a traditional career field that you had to work harder or, um, or have to face any kinds of kind of setbacks to, to be where you are today? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, being Asian American and, and pursuing an industry where uh, it's not like an industry where there are few Asian Americans. Um, I mean, it's an industry where there are no Asian Americans. Right. Um, I mean, for the last 50, 60 years, uh, 70 years, I think, you know, there, there hasn't been an Asian American in the NBA. And so, um, honestly, it, yeah, it was, it was tough. I, I remember, you know, in high school, I was the California player of the year, but I, I didn't get any scholarships from any of the colleges across the entire U.S. Um, and, and then, you know, even playing well and winning a lot of awards in college and doing really well in the pre-draft pre -draft and then going undrafted. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, uh, kind of always seen through my career that just in general, uh, if I had, if I played well, I, I couldn't just do it once. I would have to kind of prove myself a little bit more. And then uh, if I gave people uh, like a reason to doubt, uh, if I didn't show up and I didn't play well, um, that they would, you know, kind of doubt or be like, oh, see, he's not that good, that that would happen very, very quickly. Um, and so I always knew that my leash uh, was going to be much shorter than, than the average person. And, and that kind of put a, uh, chip on my shoulder to make sure that I, you know, uh, that I could try to be as consistent as possible. But again, that's just, that's, that's just a, that's just part of, that's the nature of the beast. Um, and, and that's not, you know, just because I'm Asian American, it really, it, it kind of goes to anybody who doesn't look the part in any industry. Um, and so it, it looks different everywhere, but specifically with basketball, being Asian American is definitely not something that will help me get more looks or more recognition. Um, so obviously your career took a major turn when Lynn Sanity happened. Um, what was that like and how did it impact your life? I mean, I heard you talk about having to sort of prove yourself, um, having to have like these repeat wins in a way to, to, so that people wouldn't think it was just like a thing. And then suddenly you become this national, international even like star um, from, from these Lynn Sanity games. And how did that change things for you? Uh, it changed, it changed everything. Um, like literally everything changed overnight. Um, back then I was sleeping on my brother's couch in Stye town and walking to papaya dog and McDonald's to eat. And the next thing, you know, it's like, uh, there's paparazzi everywhere and I can't move around the city. Not only that, there's paparazzi chasing my grandparents, uh, in Asia and there's, you know, reporters showing up at my high school teammates houses in, in California and, and like, and uh, unannounced. And it was just like, uh it was i can't even describe how scary and crazy it was but um i mean it was it was something back then that i really tried to disassociate myself from because i was like everyone was kind of take me everyone was trying to take me jeremy lynn as a human into like lynn sanity this phenomenon and also a lot of that within that whole change of everything like i had to deal with a lot of other stuff too with i guess just some of the um, consequences that I didn't understand that is involved with being in the spotlight. And so um, it took its toll on me. But uh, as I kind of went through my career and grew as a person and, and grew in my faith in Jesus, like I was able to kind of refine myself and, and that allowed me to not look back on it with, with almost like a, oh, I want to avoid it or never call me an insanity. Now I'm kind of more at a point where I'm fully able to embrace it and talk about it and to talk about some of the issues that or some of the things that I went through, um, some of the positives, many of the positives that, that I was able to go through, and also some of the things that I wish, you know, things had gone a little differently.
Yeah, I mean that that's that's such a fascinating uh, perspective because um, you know I know that for myself, like I wanted to be an actor at a very early age, and I would turn on the TV and or go to movies. I would never see anyone who looked like me, and so so um, I felt like I had to sort of prove myself in a very similar way. And suddenly, with Lynn Sanity, you became that face for any Asian American kid who ever wanted to go in sports. And so suddenly, you're you're being thrust, I think into a position of having to carry a lot of stuff when you're actually just a person who's trying to like do a great, great job at this, at the sport they love. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit more about that um, later, because obviously you've taken that um, gift in a way and turn it into something so positive, especially, especially right now. Um, but I also want to ask you, you're in Beijing right now. I know that you were in um, the United States, right as the coronavirus was kind of starting to happen, and then you went back to Beijing. Um, I, I believe that you know China's sort of starting to slowly come back to life. What is what is daily life like in Beijing for you right now? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, life is uh, definitely very very much closer uh, to what it was before. Um, so right now, all the restaurants and malls, like uh, the majority of them are all open. There's, uh, there is the typical Beijing traffic um, because everyone's kind of going back to work. And so uh, there's a lot of traffic. Um, and then, and then in general, just, you know, everything, you can go everywhere and do everything. You just can't do it the same in terms of in big groups. So if you go to restaurants, you can go and eat with your friends, but you might not see groups of like six, eight, 10, like you used to. Um, so right now they, they try to keep it in, in smaller, uh, you know, whether you eat with two people or four people or whatever. And then um, everywhere you go, you have this app and it tracks every single place that you've been to. It tracks your symptoms. It tracks your, you. You have to get your body temperature scanned every day. I go into my apartment, the gym, any restaurant to eat. Like I always have to get my temperature checked and I have to log in so that they know where I've been. Um, and then everyone's wearing masks and stuff. But uh, honestly, it's, it's for the most part, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's back to normal. Um, I mean, even on Sunday, I think I went to like 10 spots to eat. Like I had a, you know, I had a, <laughs> I had a cheat day on Sunday. And so I went to like 10 spots and I gained 10 pounds and I was just eating like all this stuff. But again, that goes to show like <laughs> I was eating like pizza, ice cream, burgers, wings, like but that kind of goes to show you just the, the ability for me to do that and move around and go to these spots and grab all this food. Um, <laughs> it's like, yeah, things are definitely coming back to normal. <laughs> did you did you actually gain 10 pounds in a day? Yeah, no, I did. Oh um, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot but, uh, even cause imagine. Because they gave us like a, they gave us vacation for a couple of days. And so um, I kind of, I, I went uh, I went off, off the deep end and, and, uh, put on 10 pounds. And then, uh, I guess for me, I can, I can gain and lose pretty fast. So I was back <laughs> to normal in, in, in a day or two. So that was, uh, but that was with obviously like I had to work out like three times a day for three straight days. And, um, but now it was just something fun that I wanted to do. That's amazing. So, so you talked about, you hit 10 restaurants and you talked about having pizza, burgers, and ice cream, which, which I think are, feel like quintessentially, American food. So I want to ask you, you've talked about feeling like a foreigner, both in the United States and also in China. And I think this is something that a lot of immigrants and a lot of children of immigrants experience. And obviously right now, I think a lot of Asian Americans are being, being made to feel like outsiders in the United States, being made to feel not American, even though we all are obviously American if we are here. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your own experience around that and, and you know, kind of the feelings that came up for you around being made to feel different? Yeah, um, and, I, and honestly, that's, a, that's an amazing question. I, I actually, I'll be honest here, I, I haven't fully figured it out. Like, I feel like I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, there's a lot of tension because, you know, growing up, it was always like, everyone was always like, that's that Chinese uh, import, that's that Asian kid, that's, uh, you know, go back to China. That's what all the fans and the, the you know, the, the opposing fan groups and stuff would say. And so, and, and I, and that, that is go, tying into what I was saying about Linsanity earlier. Part of the reason why I wanted to run from it all was because I wanted to be great at basketball and I wanted to be recognized for what I was doing on the court. And I felt like everyone was jumping and tying in other things. Oh, he's, he's Asian. This is, it's crazy because he's Asian or like, oh, it's crazy because he went to Harvard. 
he's a student athlete or whatever. Like, and I felt like people were just not recognizing, like they wanted to turn the narrative into whatever they wanted to turn it in. But for me, all I wanted to do, I didn't care about fame. I didn't care about money. I didn't care about any of that stuff. I just wanted to be great at basketball. And that really made me feel like I wasn't, it made me feel like I wasn't American. Um, and, and then like, you know, coming over here, everything is very, you know, it's similar. Like I, I'm fluent, but not everything, you know, a lot of the lingo or the culture or different things, like everything is so different here. Even social media, what they think is, uh, what Asia thinks is really funny or what goes viral or what is the type of content that is being engaged. Everything is very, very different uh, out here. And so I feel very, and I'm labeled as a foreigner. Uh, and I'm playing under the foreigner rules. And so um, I'm caught in this tension, man, where I'm like, man, where do I belong? Uh, and that's something that I've really wrestled with this past year. I'm like, I don't feel like, like, where's home? Or where does, where do I really truly belong? Like, if I could choose one place or one city, like, what would that look like? And, and honestly, for me, it's just, I've come to accept right now that there will be this tension between two places, especially as an immigrant, you know, growing up in the U.S. and having, and having a lot of you know, American and like Caucasian, African-American friends and then having, and then going and then playing basketball. And then I'll go home and it'd be like, I walk in the house and be take your shoes off. Um, you know, my mom's on me about everything. And, and it's just like a completely different, it was, it was like, a, like two different worlds. Um, and so right now, I think the biggest thing that I'm trying to understand is uh, that, yes, I am Asian. Yes, I'm also American. And that maybe today that's okay to be in that tension. That's a healthy place to be. And that by being in that middle ground, I actually have a unique opportunity to be a bridge um, and to be able to, you know, show people on both sides what the other side looks like. Minus, what a what a beautiful way to frame that. I love that. It's um like to see that as an opportunity, I think is such a such a great thing. Not only that that you see that, but letting um, other young people who might be going through experiences that are very similar to yours to, to let them know that there's a, they are actually, they're in a position of power in a way where they might feel um, disempowered. That's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty remarkable. Um, I do want to ask you though, like in those times where you felt like an outsider, um, were there places that you would turn to for comfort? For sure. I mean, for me, um, faith, uh, is really important to me. I mean, uh, for me, no matter what happens, whether you want to talk about all the different elements of my story, at the end of the day, for me, what ended up helping me find myself was just my faith and knowing that I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, a son of God and, and that, that my identity is in there. And I think getting to that and being having that foundationally, like, was such a uh, cornerstone for me. And um, and on top of that, then I also had my family too. And my family was there supporting me along the way. And, and a lot of times the biggest thing my family did was just, uh, you know, remind me and drive me back to God and, and remind me of my faith. And so, um, uh, you know, a big part of it, but definitely family. I mean, even along my career, I'll be very honest, like I tried to quit at times. Like I remember, I remember I, I emptied out my locker. I was with the Rockets at the time and I emptied out my locker. I brought everything out, all my shoes and clothes. And I, and I called my agent and I was like, I'm done. Uh, I'm done here. Tell him to let me go. And my family was with me in the hotel during that training camp. And they were like, and, and between them, my agent and my family, they're like, man, you gotta go back. You gotta go back for practice tonight. You can't just, you can't just quit. And so having them there along, alongside me, just like made me feel like, it doesn't matter how misunderstood I am by everybody else. As long as I have my faith here and as long as I have the people that I love next to me, like I'm a hundred percent seen and valued for who I am in, in that precious space. I love that. And I, I think, um, you know, everybody has their own sources of what that, what that place is, but I think tapping into those things are, is so important, um, especially right now. And also I love everything that you said about, family because I think one of the things that at Act to Change that, that we try to do is to encourage people to build communities, you know, to 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 not feel alone, especially if they're on the receiving end of slurs or physical violence or being bullied, to make sure that, that they build allies and that they um, 
they can have families, whether it's their actual family or another family around them to support them. Um, just speaking about that, I know you've talked about being called racial slurs, um, even at the height of your success, having people make uh, Asian jokes about you. Um, I think right now we're hearing so many stories of people being called slurs or people um, having either microaggressions um, play, played out against them or even just overt aggressions like physical violence. How, how have you reacted to either hearing these things or seeing these things in print? Um, like how, how did you deal with these things when they came up for you? Um, man, when they came up for me, honestly, when they came up for me, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really, it didn't really bother me because I was used to it my whole life. Um, I will tell you what really bothered me is when I started reading about it and seeing about it happening to other people. Um, you know, I've been called a chink and I've been called, a, you know, all these things, you know, talking about people talking about my eyes. And that, that whole thing has happened my whole my whole life. And then even in, at the height of insanity, you know, uh, there was a headline and it was chink in the armor. Um, and, and honestly, that whole situation to me, I didn't even flinch. I was like, it's cool. This is, this is everything I've, I've grown up with. What really, really messed with me was when I started seeing everything that's been happening recently. That's what's giving me a really broken heart. Um, but the one thing I will say is, um, the one thing that I've learned is that when this stuff happens, that's like, uh, it's like a critical juncture. It's like a fork in the road um, for everybody, for every Asian American uh, and, and every person that's targeted is how will you respond? And this is something that I think is really important. I'm not condoning, obviously not condoning being targeted or being bullied, but it's a, it, it creates a fork in the road for the person that has been targeted. And I haven't been physically attacked, so I can't speak to that or act like I know what that's like. I can only talk about experiencing a lot of the, the verbal slurs and, and things like that. But the fork in the road is you can either go one way and uh, you can harbor a lot of bitterness and hate and uh, essentially, you know, go down that path. And, and, and I've gone down that path at times in my life. And the only thing that I came to realize was that it kind of made me no different than anybody else then. Um, you know, if someone is ignorantly hating me, if I actually think about why they're doing that, it's probably because they themselves are hurting. And, and I think when someone is really secure and they understand and, you know, I don't think there is that need to cut somebody else down to make to make themselves feel better. A lot of times people do this because they themselves are actually really empty or really miserable inside. And I think if I and I had to learn how to see it that way versus just looking at the person who was, you know, who wrote chink in the armor or look at the person who called me a chink or whatever. And just like having tremendous hatred towards them. So that first path is, you know to add on hate onto more hate. And I think what that ends up doing for me is it taught me that joke, the joke was actually on me um, because I allowed something like that to turn me into somebody I didn't wanna be. On the flip end, if you go the other way and you can learn to have that compassion and that empathy, if you can learn, if you need just try to pause for five seconds, 10 seconds, put yourself in that person's shoes um, to, to understand maybe they're really, really going through something else that, that and, and they're, they don't know how to, process those emotions and that it just comes out in this hate in this hatred I think even that pause I'm not saying you have to become best friends with them <laughs> but just even that pause to be able to catch yourself and the thoughts that you might be thinking could be the difference um, and, and so um, could be the difference between what you do and how you act going forward and whether you can take that experience and turn it into something positive and turn you into a more loving compassionate person and so I think that's just something that I try to think about every time when I when I you know deal with this, and even when I've been reading about this, my initial instinct is to go online and tweet or say something like ridiculous to stand up for <laughs> Asian Americans, you know. But then I'm like, I have to constantly take myself back and be like, why? And that's why right now I have such a heavy heart because it's like, not only are Asian Americans being targeted and being hurt, but there's so many people out there who are doing that to Asian Americans, and it's because they're hurt themselves. I mean, I think I think you bring up a really interesting point because I think, you know, there's there's obviously an undercurrent of racism that has um, that that the coronavirus has given rise to and allowed people to just expose a sort of hatred and 
um, negativity that, that, that we haven't seen in a while, even though it's always sort of been there. But then there's that other side of it, which is I think people are really f afraid. Um, there's a lot of misinformation. There's people mislabeling the name of this virus. And so when people don't have all the information, when they don't understand things, I think they, they also sometimes um, lash out at someone else because they need someone to target, they need someone to blame. Um, so, I, so I appreciate you bringing that up. One of, one of, you mentioned the chink in the armor thing, and um, I know a little bit about that incident. That was the ESPN article, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And so, and I think, um, I, I believe that you actually sat down with the reporter who wrote, who wrote that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I do think that, you know, we've talked about this a lot on these conversations. What do you do when it happens? And I think, what do you do when someone is calling you a, a racial slur or um, intimidating you? And I think, you know, number one thing that's come up is you have to feel, you have to protect yourself, uh, your safety. So if you don't feel comfortable, just walk away from it. If you have an ally, ask them to help. If you can try to educate them on why what they're saying is offensive, that's like, that is an option that is also maybe helpful. And I think that's something you did. So can you, can you speak about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, uh, that was just something that I felt like would be really powerful in the moment and also something that I believe in it as a person. And again, a lot of that goes back to my faith and um, being, you know, turning the other cheek and, and things like that. And, and I want to make a distinction here. Like when I'm saying like, first things first, if your safety is in jeopardy, like you need to protect yourself um, and make sure that you're okay physically. Um, but like, I think in other situations, it's almost like you kill them with kindness. And, and, and it's like, look, I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure I do everything I can to help educate you on what an Asian, uh, like, uh, what an Asian American can be or who an Asian American can be. And I'm gonna show you that. And so maybe by doing that and being kind towards you and having a conversation with you, maybe that will shift your perspective on who you think Asian Americans are. And not every single person will be receptive, but that's okay, that's not on you. You can't control their reaction to it. You can only control what you do. And, and I'm not saying be a doormat, cause that's kind of what I thought for a while. I was like, oh, we'll just be a doormat. Everyone step on me. Like, no, it's not that. Like, I think there's a way that you can stand up for yourself, but at the same time, do it in a loving way where um, if you are able to find that balance and do both, no matter what the reaction is, whether it's positive or negative from that person, you can hold your head high and be like, look, I did what I needed to do. And maybe it wasn't today, but maybe somewhere down the road, I planted a seed that eventually will, you know, create a little bit more compassion in this man or woman's heart. That's, that's, that's beautiful. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do as, as an organization is educate other people. And, you know, it's why we're, we're compiling all these news stories on our website. It's why we're encouraging people to go to read about them, to understand what the issues are. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about is to say, I'm not, um, I'm not just this one thing that you want to hate. I'm actually a human being with all these other sides. And, I'm, and in the end, I think that we're not, we're all um, innately human. And so that connects us. So I appreciate, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I wanna ask you a kind of a personal question just for me. So I was like a theater kid growing up and um, often got made fun of for that in school, you know, for, for liking theater and stuff. But I, I did find in my theater community and like doing community theater and hanging out with the other actors and that there was also a sense of comfort and um, a sense of belonging that was there. Um, you've played with so many teams over many years. Have your teammates historically been allies for you? Have they posed challenges to you? Has, has being a part of a team um, helped you deal with any of the issues that you've been talking about? For sure. Um, I've never, I've never had a, a teammate. I've never had a rift with a teammate because I was Asian ever. In fact, like my teammates love that I'm Asian. I mean, I, and, and I remember it's like, it's almost adorable. Like I've had NBA teammates be like, <laughs> hold on, how are you? Asian and Chinese I feel like you can't be both like explain that to me like genuinely and it was like almost like so like it was so funny but also like so real in a sense like and they're not trying to they're not racist at all they're they're really good people they just haven't had exposure 
And so they don't understand. Even like when I explain to them, like they're like, you know, hold on. So Panda Express isn't like the quintessential Chinese food. Like seriously, because that's <laughs> all they've known is like, you know, PF, PF Chang's and, and Panda Express and whatever. And I'm not saying that there's, of course, there's definitely a lot of Asian influence in that food, but there's a lot more beyond beyond what they may have seen as Asian food. Um, and, and so being able to just educate them and spend time with them. But I think fundamentally it comes down to they, them respecting me as a person first and then being willing to learn about different parts of my culture. And what, what I ended up seeing through the course of my career is that they loved it. Um, like I've had so many teammates like ask me and beg me like, dude, please take me to Asia with you on your Asia trip. Like, I really, really want to go. I want to experience it. I want to be a part of it. I know nothing about Asia, but I really want to go. And like, they saw, I, I, I try to bring over one teammate every year and they saw some of the things we we're doing and it ended up being like, now it's like, there's always people every, every year being like, can you bring me to the summer? I've had even people in the NBA that I have never even spoken to in the middle of a game be like, I saw what you did. I saw you brought David Lee or Steve Novak. I saw that you brought so-and-so over. Like, can I come with you? And I'm like matched up against this guy, like in the middle of a game <laughs> playing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about this later. Um, like what's going on here. Um, and so I think actually like, again, it's just, respect respect from a human to human will allow will, will allow them to want to get to know you more and vice versa and, and I can say the same thing for me like when before you know when I was young and I didn't have any African-American friends like I, all I knew about was what I saw from you know media or all I knew about was what I saw from movies like you know I loved Rush Hour and the Rush Hour series and it's like that's all you know when I was really young that's all I knew and and then I started meeting a ton of my african-american teammates and i was and i was just like and now like some of my best friends are african-american and it's amazing just to be able to you know see like i go over to their house for for a meal they come over to my house and it's just amazing to kind of see the the blend um, but that's the beauty of america right you have the opportunity to do that well so speaking of um bringing different cultures together i know that you've you've talked about how we should all be in this together. And um, the, the, the concept of allyship and having allies is really important. Do you have any thoughts on how young people can form allies and, and build alliances with other cultures and other people? Um, yeah, I think the first thing is that it has to start internally. Um, like the, the first thing, if you wanna build allies, especially with people, um, like on the outside per se, like someone that doesn't look like you or think like you. I mean, the first thing I think that has to happen is there has to be a, uh, an intention internally. And um, I think it's like, the first thing I would suggest is to think about ways that you can make it about other people or get to know other people and not about yourself. Because if you go into something trying to figure out what that person can do for you or what that person should learn about you, then I would say it's probably not going to be successful. And so to really build a bridge and to really be an ally, the first thing everyone has to do is to look outward and not inward. And so that's, you know, spending time asking questions and or taking that first step and it might be awkward or whatever. But again, that has to come from you to be able to go and do that. And then um, and, and that would be the catalyst for it. And so I would say definitely the first step is to internally get your place where you can look outward. And when you do that, I think what, when I've done that in the past, one thing that I've always kind of just seen is that like, man, everyone is so willing to talk about themselves. <laughs> like if I ask someone questions, like I might just ask questions and I might sit there for an hour and not say a word other than like a follow-up question. And, and, but I think what ends up happening is I learned so much about them and then, and then they're like, oh, well, what about you? And, and I think that by just even sitting there and listening, or sitting there and taking that first step, um, that's a sign of humility. And uh, honestly, I think that goes a long way. Um, I think people are people, people are wired to love and be loved. And if you do that, and if you, uh, but again, that has to come from just this internal uh, place where you're like, hey, it's not 100% about me. I wanna get to know somebody else. It's like, that's so beautiful. You make such, such a good point about being interested in others. And I think there's, 
um, you know, there's a history of, I think, marginalized communities sort of feeling like there's not enough. And so we all have to like protect our own and fight for just the, these little scraps at the bottom of, of a barrel. And that has allowed other groups to divide us. And what I think I'm hearing you say and say so beautifully is that if we're actually just interested in other people, we can all come together and then we won't be so divided. And, and I, I hope that there's a lot of young people who are tuning in today who will remember what you said about um, just asking a question and then listening for an hour because people do wanna share their stories. And if we're just like open to listen, um, how incredible is that? Um, I want to save a little time to get to some audience Q&A, but I wanna ask you about Be The Light. Um, I wanna ask you about Feeding America and Direct Relief. Um, you have used your platform to raise, to give $500,000 to, to um, in matching other contributions, raise another over, I think, 300000 I think you're at over $800,000 now for COVID relief. Um, and those organizations um, are, they're, they're, being, they're responding to the coronavirus in the U.S., is that right? Yeah. Um, Feeding America. But you also directed funds um, to Wuhan as well. So I want to just ask you about your philanthropy right now. If you can tell us a little bit about these organizations, what compelled you to lift them up and um, why philanthropy is so important to you right now? Um, philanthropy is important to me. Um, man, I'm sorry to be repeating myself, but again, it's just, it's my faith. Um, like uh, receiving Jesus' unconditional love gives me a lot of freedom to be able to go and spread that love to other people. That's genuinely where it's coming from. It's not about, it's not about me wanting to be known as a philanthropist or anything like that. It's just, I've been loved. I've been given so much and, um, you know, I, I'm willing to, to give to other people. And, and um, again, I think for me specifically with Be The Light campaign, the reason why we chose uh, Feeding, Feeding American Direct Relief is because right now two of the most pressing issues are meals and PPEs, um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's that simple right now in terms of trying to get as much, uh, as much equipment and food for people who are just trying to survive. And the thing about this campaign that I've started is, you know, I think it's easy, or I think the cheap thing to do is to just do a one-time big pledge or to, uh, you know, match or whatever, or, or, or just to do it for a week or just to do it one time. And my team has challenged me a lot on this. It's like, no, the cheap thing to do is, is just to be like, here, here's, here's some money to some, an organization. You guys do a great job. Um, and then like, uh, and that's it actually. But what we plan on doing is, you know, and this is a shout out to my team too, who's doing all the research and doing everything. They're creating this campaign based on how the effects of COVID will end up sh turning out. And so I think one thing right now is we're focused on PPEs and meals, but as everything and the effects of COVID continue to, to, to turn like and, and change society, this campaign is also going to change. And so we're going to highlight other organizations as well. We have, you know, we're going to highlight uh, upcoming organizations that are doing great work in like specific areas. And, and, you know, one of them may be about, you know, water and, and clean water and another may be about something else. And another may be about API hate and stuff like that. And, Eventually, I think what we're going to do is turn it into, you know, one thing that we're seeing right now is a lot of nonprofits are no longer in existence because of COVID and because of lack of funds. And so that will be an issue. And that's maybe not the most prime issue right now as we're still trying to flatten the curve. But eventually that will be a huge issue is like, what about all the people that these nonprofits were serving and these nonprofits are no longer able to function or be in existence? How can we help there? And so this campaign will evolve, um, but right now in the beginning stages, that's where we're at. And we're blown away. I mean, even Feeding American Direct Relief have told us like, hey, we've done a lot of campaigns, um, but like your fans have, and even people that I don't, aren't even my fans, people don't care about basketball have, have been a part of it. And to me, it's like, man, that is like everything that we're looking for in a time of division and hate. Like, the fact that so many people have rallied around us and um, and are able to do that is, is amazing. If um, if people wanted to donate, where can they go to do that? Um, so, uh, one sec. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no worries. It's your eight forty-five hey, in the morning. What day is that? Five Uh I think uh, I ended up I ended up going to. <laughs> I went to the ER yesterday because I was having some stomach 
gastrointestine something there's something with my stomach so i think my my trainer is just uh checking in on me to make sure how i'm doing but um uh <laughs> how but, are uh, you doing are you doing okay i'm okay i'm okay it still hurts but uh it's it's not a big deal at all um this you know me doing this act, act to change thing I, I i don't even feel it anymore it'll hurt it'll hurt after i'm done with, with this but uh well, no it, hope- not the pizza and the burgers that was like five days ago <laughs> <laughs> um well, I, I hope the, you feel what better was, what was the question? <laughs> um if people want to give to the be the light campaign oh, right. where can they where can they do that um, and if someone so from the, our team can put this in the chat that'd be fantastic cool yeah no i appreciate that it's covid.jalen7.com um the other thing is on my instagram jalen7 um, on my Instagram, I'm constantly giving updates and, and we haven't figured out the, how the campaign will evolve because we're still monitoring everything. Um, but like it will continue to evolve as, as society evolves. And so I will continue to spend, uh, continue to post updates there. Fantastic. Um, Jeremy, and I know you also have um, a foundation, the Jeremy Lin Foundation that serves young people. Um, so right now, I think there's a lot of young people who are probably feeling isolated, feeling alone. Um, obviously in our communities, a lot of people are being bullied. Um, I want to ask you if you just have any messages you'd like to send to a young person who might be experiencing bullying and also, um, just to keep in theme with this, with the service you're doing, um, do you have any thoughts on ways young people can be engaging in service and philanthropy? Yeah. Um, I think for all the young people out there uh, who are experiencing bullying, the biggest thing I would say is never let somebody tell you who you are or who you aren't. Never let them tell you what you can or can't do. Anybody who has been bullied um, or is experiencing bullying, that bully probably knows nothing about you. They probably know very little about you. They might go to school with you and they might see you every day, but they know nothing about you. They know nothing about your family. Um, and, and, and even if they did, they still don't know many things about you. And, and I had to wrestle with this where like eventually I started to tune out the voices of the people that weren't in my life. And, and, and I think that that is so important. It's like never let somebody tell you what you can or can't do. If I like if I did that, I would have never been able to play basketball, even at the high school level. Um, and I'm not saying it's all because I did an amazing job. It's because actually there's a whole bunch of people who are trying to tell me what I couldn't do, but then there was only a select few people that really truly knew who I was and truly loved me. And they continue to tell me what I could do and who I am and what I'm capable of. And I think that love that I can experience from the people that I trust and are close to me should be so much more impactful and it should be so much bigger of a voice than these outside people who know nothing about you. And so I think like, you know, when they come at you, you should, it's like, it's like almost like a, a drop of water. But when you have your family who is like, or your friends who are telling you what to do, it should feel like, like you, you're under a waterfall. Like that to me is like, if I could draw an analogy of what it should feel like, it's like one speck of water touched me. It's like, cool, like, see ya. And, and obviously that's easier said than done. This is not like, and be patient with yourself. This is not something that, just because I say it one time, you're like, oh, okay, done. Speck of water, waterfall. No, it's not like that. It's like, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of internal wrestling and be okay with the emotions that you feel. Process those emotions that you feel, the anger, all of that. Like, don't just be like, ignore it. Like, process it, go through it, be okay with it. And um, and that, that would be my biggest advice. And for young people too, one thing that you can do, like I'm not asking every young person to donate money. That, that doesn't make sense. It, it, unless you're somehow like, you know, killing it financially. But um, like, I think what you can do is just the first thing you can do that I'm encouraging everybody, if you don't know what to do, first thing you can do is stop yourself from posting hateful comments one way or the other. Um, like that to me would go a long way if we just stopped that. And that's, you know, people that are targeting Asian Americans, but also in reverse, the way that we're coming, that we can come back at people, let's, also stop on that end and 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 i think if we can get to that point maybe we can challenge people's understandings of who asian americans are and be like dang that was not what i expected 
wow, that was extremely kind. And so that would be one way and, or get to know somebody that you uh, is outside of your comfort zone. It's beautiful. I hope, hopefully everyone will remember speck of water waterfall, even if we can't put it into practice right away, or it takes time to really understand it. What a beautiful image that people can walk away with from this, this conversation. Um, I do want to ask you some, we have, we have a number of questions from, from, um, that are participants. So I wanted to ask you some of these. Um, here's uh, one question that came in that says, after making it to the MBA, did the front office of any of your, of any of your teams develop any programming to help drive a more inclusive culture? And were any of those approach, uh, which approaches of those were impactful? Um, I, you know, the MBA in general has done some stuff to, yeah, for sure. Like they have little seminars and I mean, every player in the NBA, we have to go through a ton of seminars every, every season, um, you know, whether it's, you know, anti-drug, anti-violence, or even, yeah, some of these are like inclusivity and, and things like that. And so, um, you know, they're definitely there. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Like I struggle in classroom settings. I don't know if I really remember any of them. I know that I had them, but I don't really remember them. I think honestly, the biggest thing for inclusivity was just the time that we spent together. Um, like that was the biggest thing. Like you had, you get on the court, da, 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 you might get upset at each other. Teammates may want to fight. But then you turn around and you have dinner that night and you and you bury it. And like those things, I mean, those things are so valuable. It's like actually walking through life, actually going through the conflicts and then coming out of those conflicts. Those are the things that like actually like through a lot of the conflicts. To me, a lot of these conflicts were just like stepping stones. It was like something that I thought was bad. And I was like, oh, man, here's a conflict. But then through a conversation or through something like we were able to see each other and respect each other in new ways. I mean, and, and I think that's like, for some of my teammates, you know, there's a teammate who's a superstar who, you know, I didn't really vibe with. And then finally it came to a point where we had, a, we had, we were in the ice bath, you know, after a practice. And then we just like really shared from our hearts. And at that time before we kept, you know, getting in it with each other. And then after that, it was like, we respected each other in such a different way. And one of the, th you know, undertones, I think, was that like Asians, you know, or Asian Americans, oh, you won't say anything to me. You won't, you won't tell me how you really feel because, because, you know, you're just passive. And, and that was one of the undertones that maybe he was thinking. And when I came out and I said everything that I said, he respected me in a new way. When I heard from his end, everything he was going through and the pressure that he had to face, that respect, that I respected him in a new way, in a new way as well. That, that's fantastic. I feel like, I feel like you kind of, maybe spoke to this a little bit in, in that story, but we had another question that said, do you have any personal stories of being bullied overtly in the NBA and how did you address it? Was it, was it just with a teammate? Did you go to leadership? Did, you know, how, how did you deal with that? Um, you know, I, uh, I've never been bullied for being Asian. I've never really been bullied in the NBA. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, it's more just, it's more just, conflict normal conflict among professional basketball players um and and i think but in those situations again i think it comes to a place where if i'm only carrying hate and bitterness that doesn't i, I don't have any more space to be able to have room for empathy and compassion so like before i even do anything i have to resolve certain things in my own heart and once i build that space out to be open-minded and to want to hear what maybe they're thinking and to be like oh maybe there is something that I'm doing that's really frustrating them. Um, instead of only focusing on their faults, then I'm able to have a conversation. And from that, it's like, you know, it's very rare that if you have someone that's on your team that like, if you're like, hey, uh, you know, human to human, I would love to have a conversation that they would be like, no. Uh, I think most people, if you go about the right way, would be like, yeah, I'm willing to have that conversation. And so, you know, we've had many conversations, especially for me as a point guard. It's like, hey, look, this is what I think about you. And I've had to say some really tough things to some tough players uh, as a point guard and as a leader. Um, but again, it's like the honesty. If you can be honest in a respectful way, like more times than not, you'll see so many positives come from it. And, and, that, and, that's, uh, and that's how I would try to approach it with, with uh, bullies or people that maybe you don't always see eye to eye with. I wanna ask you one last audience uh, question. 
Um, when did you begin to recognize the importance of your platform as a public figure to shed light on the Asian American experience and how did that evolve for you? It's kind of a big question, but. Um, Ooh, that is a big yeah. question, man. I, uh, you know, after Linsanity, um, Linsanity changed everything for me, but it took a lot of time. In the beginning with Linsanity, I was like, hey, uh, there's all these Asian jokes and they're, they're stupid. Like, if you're going to make it, if you're going to make fun of me for being Asian, at least make it funny. You're using some recycled content that's trash. That's not funny at all. Um, and, and that's kind of what I thought about. I was like, oh, that's annoying. Stop talking about me being Asian. And I went through this whole, like, I went from, like, that to, like, then I became bitter, then I became jaded, then I became angry. And then like through that, I had to process all those emotions. And eventually, once I found my faith again and, and reevaluated who I was, I was like, hey, this shouldn't affect me this much. And I started getting back to rebuilding myself. And then that, that anger turned into a, a gradual appreciation and that appreciation turned into a full on embrace. And that's where I'm at right now. It's like, I'm full on embracing that I'm Asian American. You can say what you want and think what you want, but that's not going to change how I feel about myself and how I feel about Asian Americans. And, and so, um, you know, I think that's just the process that I went through. And, um, and, and so now it's like, that's, that's something that I want to do. That's something I want to be. That's something I want to speak out on. And, and the last thing I'll say about that is if all I'm known for is to stand out for Asian Americans, I will actually have failed in what I'm trying to do. Um, when I say be the light, I'm not saying be the light only for Asian Americans. I actually think what Asian Americans need to do, first off, yes, we need to unify and we need to have solidarity and we need to defend ourselves and stand up for ourselves. That is 100% extremely important. That's what I'm doing and or trying to do at least. But the next thing that we need to do as a minority group or as an oppressed group is we need to start understanding what is going on with other oppressed groups and start standing up for them as well. And when we start to do that, and when a press group stands up for another press group, and when the press group come together and stand up for each other, and not just their own, then we'll really start to see some serious challenges to mainstream media, mainstream society, and we'll start to see some of the social justice reforms that I think everybody wants to see. And so that is the long-term end game. We have to be realistic with ourselves. We cannot, as Asian Americans, only care about Asian Americans. Let's start here for sure. And I'm right here with you. I'm gonna take every step with you. But eventually, as in a minority group, we have to start understanding and standing up for other minority groups too, and, and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for saying that. Thank you so much. Um, we had over 60 questions come in today. Obviously, we're not gonna get to all of them. I apologize. Um, but I do want to close out with one thing, Jeremy. We end each of these COVID combos with something that we call the kindness table. And we envision this as a place where teachers, students, parents can come together and do one thing today that is an act of kindness. Because we truly believe, and I've heard you say this so many times, but that kindness is an antidote to hate. So um, we, if you could just offer one thing that someone at home can do today that's an act of kindness, um, for the kindness table, that would be incredible. Um, man, the thing I would say is tell uh, your family or tell the people that mean the most to you, tell them that you love them. And, and the reason why I say that is because, you know, growing up Asian American sometimes is a little bit awkward. Uh, like my parents weren't always the most expressive with things like that. And even with my brothers, I love them so much and they knew that, but I didn't say that to them until I was like 20, 21. And now we say it all the time and it's not awkward at all, but that's something I would say is like, Hey man, go up to your parents or go up to your brother or your sister and just tell them you love them. Like, and if that's normal for you, then cool. That's still an act of kindness. You can do it. But if it's not, then that's a big step. But I, I highly encourage you. That's like one of the best things you can do. Once that, and now me and my family, we say it normally, and it's not a big deal at all. But like, uh, man, it was, it's true. We got to let them know what we have this time. So that was what I would say. That's such a beautiful way to close out. Please, if you are at home, tell the person that you're at home with that you love them today. Um, I want to offer up a kindness thing. Um, as always, mine is to take a minute to visit acttochange.org and take the pledge to stand up to bullying. Um, I mentioned before that for May, we're doing a month-long giving campaign through GoFundMe. 
Um, you can click on the link that should pop up in our chat box if you're able to make a tax deductible donation. Um, it helps us so much. Um, follow us on social media to help amplify the message. Follow Jeremy at jlin 7 and contribute to Be The Light if you are able to. Um, we have also compiled anti-bullying resources at actochange.org. We have a list of organizations that you can report incidences to. We also have a list of crisis prevention hotlines and we have news stories that we encourage you to read. I wanna thank all of our participants for joining us today. Um, thank you to all of the organizations that help promote um, and live stream, including Angry Asian Man, Teach for America, National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, Asian American News, Hate is a Virus, Stage 13, and the Jeremy Lin Facebook page. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you to my entire team at Act to Change. Jeremy, thank you for your generosity and for sharing your incredible story and for touching everyone who tuned in today. I wanna close out with a Jeremy Lin quote. Jeremy recently wrote, in adversity, we will persevere. In challenges, we will overcome. In fear, we will have faith. And in darkness, we will be light. Thank you, Jeremy, for those beautiful words. Thank you so much for being here today. I encourage all of you to follow Jeremy and be the light. Together, we can put an end to bullying and hate. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Jeremy. That was incredible. You're amazing. I'm so grateful. I hope you feel better. <laughs> I didn't realize you were dealing with like all of that and at like eight in the morning. So thank you so much. No, no worries. Thanks for having me. You're the man. That was that was cool. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. All right, talk to you later. Bye.